The bubonic plague is a well-known illness of the medieval era, but many people today seem to think that it is an illness of history that is no longer relevant in the modern world. But that's not really the case. While the bubonic plague has been around at least since 541 AD, it continues to impact the world, with 107 confirmed cases in the United States since the year 2000, and 56 cases in the Democratic Republic of the Congo just this year. This medieval disease never really left. But the efforts throughout history to eradicate the Black Death deserve to be remembered. Symptoms of plague include fever, chills, fatigue, and a headache. Symptoms that are common with many illnesses, but the swelling of lymph nodes followed by the skin turning black is what stood apart when the plague hit. A modern antibiotic, such as doxycycline, administered within the first 24 hours is the only effective treatment, and even then there is still an 11% death rate. If not administered quickly enough, survival diminishes to a mere 27%. Even if someone survived the bubonic plague, they still had to watch out for the lesser-known septicemic plague. When a swollen lymph node, also known as a bubo, bursts, the plague can enter the bloodstream, creating a new variation of plague. This variation is less common, but more deadly, with only a 60% survival rate even with immediate treatment. Those who do not receive treatment for this type have virtually no chance at survival, due to complications such as organ failure and internal hemorrhaging. While modern treatments for the plague can largely be effective if administered within the first 24 hours, what about the people who came before those developments? Well... They were not so lucky. While not so much is known about the first wave of the Black Death, which came during the Justinian era in the mid-6th century, the second wave of the Black Death saw major medical developments. The second wave of plague occurred in the mid-14th century, at a time when bloodletting was the medical cure for everything. Bloodletting is the act of using leeches or cuts to drain the supposedly infected blood from patients. Little did they know that it was actually spreading the plague at a faster rate. When bloodletting was seen as ineffective, doctors turned to remedies that their patients could consume or inhale. They would go through many until the patient passed away and pick up where they left off with the next patient. The plague supplied doctors with a multitude of patients to try various and often new remedies on. These new remedies included many tonics of crushed herbs mixed with liquor or boiled water. An example was a book published by one W.J. Ghent in 1665 entitled A Collection of Seven and Fifty Approved Receipts Good Against the Plague, taken out of the five books of the renowned Dr. Don Alexis Secrets for the benefit of the poor sort of people of these nations. One of these remedies directs one to take three ounces of the liquor of the inner rind of an ash tree and still with it three ounces of white wine and administer it every three hours. Mr. Ghent suggests that the infected should be healed within a day. And so this purported cure for the deadly plague was really just some wine mixed with tree bark. Another one of his recipes suggests using one-third part fine treacle, one-third part aquavita, and for the other third, the urine of a man-child who is a virgin. Now these tonics didn't work, but they did demonstrate how little doctors understood the plague and, well, illness in general. Other types of remedies included smoke, herbs, and flowers. It was often thought that if citizens inhaled the impure scent of death or illness, then they themselves would fall ill as well. Some of these inhaled remedies included burning herbs in fires made within homes of those infected or those trying to avoid infection. Some towns would even create vast bonfires, believing the smoke would drive the foul air away from the citizens. Flowers were often kept in pockets or perfumed fabrics close by for those uninfected to cover their nose with and breathe in when in the vicinity of people who may spread infection. Another major change to medical practices was the use of protective gear and clothing. Doctors wore long gowns made of leather to protect their skin, along with gloves and boots. The most identifiable characteristic of these new protective outfits were the beaks on the plague masks, which were thought to give the air enough time to purify before reaching the wearer, and were often filled with fresh flowers and herbs to ward off any infected smells thought to spread plague. While the plague doctor outfit has come to be recognized as a symbol of the Black Death, it was likely only used by a few physicians, and the first mention of the outfit didn't occur until 1619. It might seem that the outfit, by fully covering the doctor, would at least provide protection, but a March 2020 edition of National Geographic notes that while the plague doctors may have been immediately recognizable, their costumes didn't provide any real protection against the disease. And while cutting-edge medical science was suggesting funny outfits and drinking urine, others turned to more religious solutions. Many communities and churches blamed the plague on God's displeasure. They shifted the blame from medical reasons to religious ones. 
Often widows, the poor, or unmarried mothers were blamed as they could easily be accused of angering God by their misfortune. This resulted in self-mutilation, feeding on the idea that by shedding blood they could expel any negativity from their body and purify it. Another religious target was Jews. A 2010 publication of the Constitutional Rights Foundation notes that in 1348, a rumor claimed that Jews were responsible for the plague as an attempt to kill Christians and dominate the world. The rumor spread quickly, supported by a widely distributed report of the trial of Jews who supposedly had poisoned wells in Switzerland. Swiss officials claim the charges were true since many Jews have been submitted to torture and confessed. The rumor set off a wave of pogroms against Jews. Christians attacked them in their communities, burned their homes, and sent them down the Rhine River in wine barrels and murdered them with clubs and axes. In perhaps the worst case, the people of Strasbourg locked up and burned 900 Jews alive. That hysteria slowly died down after it was condemned by Pope Clement VI in 1349. As the church proved helpless to protect the laity or even its own priest, the religious nature of Europe changed. Some turned their backs on religion and faith in the Catholic Church declined. Others turned towards religious fanaticism, among them the flagellants who tried to fight the disease via extreme atonement, publicly whipping themselves. While the movement predated the plague, the numbers swelled in response. The long-term effect on religion in Europe was significant. A 2020 edition of The Humanist argues that the plague led to a rejection of the superstitions of the Catholic Church, thus being an early form of Protestantism. Another solution, quarantining, also had profound impacts. Entire towns began shutting down their borders and ports in an attempt to prevent the plague from entering their communities. As a result, many communities lost their trade routes, and others reliant on traded goods would seek out new partners to maintain the number of resources necessary to continue functioning. Not only were trade partnerships broken, but those recovering from outbreaks often found themselves cut off from resources needed to repair their communities, such as food, textiles, and other necessary imported supplies. If the economic impacts were not devastating enough, it destroyed the social lives of those who survived. Many families and friends were torn apart as towns and villages were locked down. Grandparents, parents, and children were found deceased, sometimes leaving siblings orphaned with no relatives remaining. These children were often placed in homes and forced into lives of servitude. Family members would abandon anyone suspected of plague and attempt to run away in the night or before anyone noticed that their family had been infected. Neighbors and friends turned on each other, hoarding the increasingly rare resources needed for survival. Governments and law enforcers would often flee first, having been notified of an oncoming plague outbreak by those in surrounding areas. Looting and theft increased, since no one remained to enforce laws. Ironically, while the medieval plague seems to be generally well known, the modern outbreaks seem to be much less so. The third plague pandemic began in China in 1894 and quickly began spreading, first to British Hong Kong and then to India. Their French-Russian physician, Valdemir Hofkine, who had developed a vaccine for cholera in 1892, produced a vaccine for the plague in 1897. According to a December 2020 edition of the BBC News, tests of the vaccine's efficiency showed between a 50% and 85% reduction in mortality. Despite the vaccine, however, the plague killed 1,143,993 people in India at its peak in 1904. On December 11, 1899, the first suspected case of bubonic plague reached the Chinese community of the U.S. territory of Hawaii. The plague there died out by March, but not before claiming the lives of 178 within the four-month outbreak. A 2019 article in the Journal of the Science History Institute reports that one official response was to burn down several buildings thought to be infected. Shortly after the Hawaii outbreak, the body of a Chinese man was discovered in Chinatown, San Francisco. At the time, only a white doctor could issue a death certificate, so one was called in. And while it was first suspected the man had passed from common causes, the physician discovered signs of bubonic plague. The epidemic became embroiled in local politics. The Science History Institute notes that local officials played down the threat of plague to protect interstate trade and travel. Newspapers were skeptical. The Institute notes the San Francisco Chronicle viewed the quarantine as a scheme by officials at the Board of Health to boost their budget appropriation. What reaction there was targeted the Asian community of San Francisco, reinforced by long-standing anti-Chinese sentiments in the United States. Soon, all of Chinatown was being roped off and monitored by a large police force that refused to let anyone of the community leave. This quarantine only lasted two days before protests from both Asian and white citizens began and restrictions were lifted. Two months later, more Asian citizens were found deceased from the plague, and as a result, the implementation of an unrelenting quarantine and inoculation soon followed. But the vaccine offered to the citizens of San Francisco's Chinatown was only accepted by a few, 
some of whom had major adverse reactions requiring further medical assistance. There was a backlash, and local gangs threatened to harm anyone who agreed to get a vaccine, and businesses closed in protest to the vaccination measures. The city then created an ordinance requiring all people of Asian descent to get the vaccine or be quarantined. Eventually, the issue was brought before the courts. In 1900, the United States Circuit Court for the Northern District of California found the quarantine measures to be unreasonable, unjust, and oppressive, and therefore contrary to the laws limiting the police powers of the state and municipality in such matters. As a result, forced quarantine and inoculations ceased. The most effective response came from efforts by the U.S. Marine Hospital Service to clean up city streets and exterminate rats. In fact, San Francisco had been lucky, with death tolls far smaller than Hong Kong or India, largely, the Science History Institute suggests, because the most common flea in the city was a northern European species, which, when it bites, injects less bacteria from its gut into its host than does its Asian cousins. The last case in Chinatown occurred March 1st, 1904, and the outbreak has since been largely forgotten. But despite having ended in Chinatown, the plague made a dramatic comeback in San Francisco in 1907 and 1908, killing another 172 people. An outbreak in Los Angeles in 1924 killed 30. The bubonic plague has continued to pop up within the state of California and surrounding areas. On average, about 20 cases occur yearly in the United States. These cases, similar to small outbreaks in other countries, are rarely reported in the media. You might imagine in the modern world where we're better at tracking people, where we're better at sanitation, that it would be easier to prevent the spread of illness. But the fact is with modern travel, a person with pneumonic plague could easily climb on an airplane, travel between continents, and infect everybody on that plane with the droplets that are produced when they cough. The risk of another global wave of the Black Death is still very real, if not discussed very often in public. And of course, the last few years have taught us that the risk of pandemic is certainly real, threatening both lives and economies, and that medical science and government sometimes still struggle to find the right answers. And thus, understanding of long-forgotten historic illnesses like the bubonic plague can help both inform public understanding and government response to global crisis. And that is certainly history that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.